In this lesson, we're gonna take a look at combining pen and ink applications with watercolor washes to create a wonderful image of a seagull. Hello there everyone, Matt here with TheVirtualInstructor.com and in this lesson we're going to combine pen and ink applications with watercolor washes to create a wonderful image of a seagull. We're also going to try to incorporate some design elements at the end to make the image pop a little bit more. Now if you're brand new to this channel, I suggest that you subscribe. I create videos on a broad spectrum of a variety of drawing and painting mediums. Now with that being said, let's go ahead and dive into this lesson. Now for this painting, I'm going to be working on 140 pound hot press watercolor paper. I'll be using Stiegler pens for the inking part and Kotman watercolors for the watercolor portion. We'll take a closer look at the materials before we start each section. Now we'll start here with a 2H graphite pencil, just lightly sketching the basic shapes that we see on the seagull. Now I'm working from a photo reference that I picked up from a wonderful site called pixabay.com. You can see I'm starting with the head, but I'm trying to make sure that I can visually fit everything within the picture plane. So I'm keeping in mind uh, the overall shape of the body of the seagull, making sure I have ample room at the bottom to include the post that this particular bird is standing on. Now you'll see here that we started with basic shapes with very, very light marks and then progressively we're starting to add some of the contour lines or the outlines and also some of the details like the beak of course. Now we'll also pay special attention to where we place the eye. We need to make sure that that's in the right location. We'll just draw a simple circle for it at this point. You'll also notice that I'm drawing with lots of lines. I'm not trying to get the exact perfect line with this initial sketch. I'm using multiple lines and basically just feeling out the basic proportions of the bird. Now that we've got the basic proportions of the body of the bird in place, we can start working our way downward on the picture plane. We'll add a couple of the legs here. And you can see where there's a joint. I'm drawing a circle for that. That will help to ensure that I get the correct contour line when I go back over the top of this section in a few moments. We'll also draw the post and we'll pay special attention to the fact that the post is at a diagonal. Now this is important because it adds a little bit of tension to the drawing, positive tension, something that we actually want in this particular image. You can imagine if we made the post completely vertical, it would make the image a little bit too static. We'll go in now and add those contour lines for the legs and a few bits of information for the details. We're not going to get too carried away with the details since we're going to develop those with the pen and ink applications for the most part. We'll also add a few details for the post as well, just some elements like a couple of knots and things. Now at this point, now that I've got the post in place, I see that I need to go back and refine the shape of the body. I've made the bird's body a little bit too long. So I'm just going to use a kneaded eraser and remove what graphite marks I need and then make those adjustments. Of course if I would have used a darker graphite pencil this would have been a little bit more difficult to achieve. That's why it's important with a pen and ink and watercolor image that you start with a light application initially. Now we'll refine some of the contour lines and develop some of the details further. I've added the pupil in the eye and a few gestural marks for the wings. Now we're ready to start making our inking applications and I'm going to use a 0.05 millimeter pen by Stiegler for all of the applications. Of course we'll use a variety of different strokes here and there to create a little bit more variety in the drawing itself. We'll start with a broken line going right over the contours of the top of the head. Just bring that line down using some looser marks to indicate some of the feathers. We'll, we'll do the same for the beak, again using a slightly broken line. And then we'll start defining some of the details of the eye, like the pupil and the outer edge of the eye itself. It's okay, like always, to be a little bit looser with your pen and ink applications. You don't want to be too stiff and rigid. It's okay to allow your actual mark or the actual movement of your hand to show through in the marks that you make. This gives your drawing a little bit more character. Working outward from the eye, we'll start pulling strokes in the direction that the feathers are growing, again to create a little bit of an illusion of texture as we begin developing some of the values. And as we continue to develop the values, you can see we're putting some more textural marks at the top of the head. We've added a little indication of shadow on the beak. We need to be mindful of the fact that we're going to be adding watercolor applications later on in the process. So we don't want to make sure 
or we want to make sure that our we don't make our drawing too dark initially with the pen and ink applications. Sometimes it's easy to get carried away with the pen and ink applications and just develop a full pen and ink drawing. Then when you go back to add those watercolor applications, you find that your final image is a little bit too dark. So we need to be thinking about our value relationships as we're develop developing the pen and ink drawing to make sure that we don't get too carried away. However, we still do need to develop uh, a little bit of value and also the texture here. So we'll continue that process up here. Again, just making a few smaller marks to indicate some of the darker sections on the top of the head. And then we'll return down to the darker wings on the left side of the body. And because these wings are darker than the values around it, we can add a little bit more of the pen and ink here. But you'll see here, I'm still being fairly cautious, leaving ample areas of light space uh, of course of the white of the paper showing through and for the most part I'm using hatching using directional strokes to help to indicate the texture of these feathers now you'll see that they curve slightly as we work our way around the body so these lines not only develop the texture and the value but they also help to create a little bit of an illusion of form now on the bottom of the body, we've got darker values here as well, and you can see I'm starting to do some of that cross hatching there, but before we get to that, we'll go ahead and develop the darkest feathers that extend out from the bottom of the body, and these are just an extension of the feathers that we just developed on the left side of the body. So clearly as we make marks closer to each other, we make the values a little bit darker. And of course, as we leave open spaces, we make the values a little bit lighter. And this is important to remember as we move on to the next step where we're creating some of those subtle darker values that happen as the body curves underneath uh, or the form comes outward and then curves underneath. So we've got some shadow that happens underneath the body. So we'll use some cross hatching here, but you'll notice that this cross hatching has a, a, a deliberate method. We're allowing these marks to curve slightly as we work our way around the form of the body. So not only will these strokes help to develop the darker values or the shadows here, and as well as the texture, but they'll also help to communicate the actual form of the body of the bird as well. So remember when you're working with pen and ink, you're working with line obviously, but you can also use line in a variety of different ways to communicate a variety of different textures as well as the form and the value. And this is echoed as we work our way down the body of the, or the legs of the bird underneath the body. You can see that I'm using more horizontal lines to indicate this particular section, which we'll continue on with in just a moment. But for now, we'll go back to the main portion of the body and continue with that cross hatching. And as we work our way up, of course, the values are getting a little bit lighter, so we'll start to incorporate more of the white space in between these marks to create the impression of a slightly lighter value. And sometimes it's hard for a beginning artist to force themselves to make marks in open spaces like this. They feel like they got to fill it in with additional applications of pen and ink, or they just feel like those marks seem almost orphaned out in the middle of the white of the paper. But it's okay to leave these marks. You can see those on the top portion of the section we're developing right now. Because remember, we're going to go back with watercolor applications in a few moments. And of course, some of that watercolor or some of these watercolor applications will help to develop the values and the tones in these locations as well. We'll make the shadow just underneath the body a little bit darker and then it's on to the legs. We'll pull down some of a few more marks for the feathers that extend out just above the leg. And then just as we've done throughout the process, we'll start by basically defining the contour lines or the outlines initially of each of the legs. And you can see I'm using a little bit of variety in the stroke here just to create uh, the impression of uh, some additional texture here as we develop the values here. Now in this particular case our light source is originating from the right side so that means that our shadowed sides are going to exist on the left side of the bird. So you can see this as we work our way down each one of the legs. We're going to put a heavier concentration of marks on the left side of each one of these legs. Now of course some shadow is cast as well so the top portion of the legs are going to be a little bit darker so we're going to have a heavier concentration of marks there as well. 
we use a few squiggly lines down here on the bottom of the feet um, as we start to develop some of the texture down there and we just want to suggest the texture we don't want to describe it completely and even in the the darker talons that happen here that appear black we're going to leave a couple of open spaces as well we don't need to fill those in as a solid area of black that would be distracting in this particular drawing since we're not going to have any solid applications other than the pupil. We'll continue adding just a little bit of shadow down here again using a bit of hatching and some looser squiggly marks. And then we'll start addressing the post and here again we'll start with the contour lines or the outlines. Once we've got our contour lines in place, we can start developing some of the textures here. You can see I've moved this knot, this particular knot in the wood, up a little bit higher on the picture plane. I want it to be visible, and uh, we've got one on the right and one on the left. And for the most part, we're going to use mostly diagonal strokes here that mimic the same edge of the contour lines that we drew originally. But we're going to break up the space a little bit around the knot. There's mostly circular strokes, and we're going to add a few few vertical strokes here and there just to break up the texture of this particular post. We'll make the shadows a little bit deeper on the top edge where there's a little bit of an overhang creating a cast shadow and of course the bird itself is creating a little bit of cast shadow up here as well. Even in the cracks, uh, as we start developing some of the darker values in the cracks, you can see that I've just changed the direction of the stroke as I'm adding the hatching here. That change in direction will create some contrast, but we're not filling in these cracks completely as a black line. There's still some open space showing through there. You should never feel like you have to follow the photo reference completely or exactly. In fact, I would never recommend that you do that. We're using the photo reference basically as a reference. So we're referring to it to get little bits of information about the texture and then we're allowing ourselves to be a little bit more free as we develop these textures in the drawing. So we're not copying it exactly, of course. That would probably drive you crazy if you tried to mimic every little stroke and line that you saw in your reference. So we want to just create the impression or the illusion of the wood texture here and this is accomplished of course with the vertical strokes and then just breaking up that space every once in a while with uh, some horizontal strokes as I mentioned before. We're also having some elements where we're creating the slightly darker values here and there just to create a little bit more of the impression of form and of course the texture. Now since our light source is originating from the right side, as I mentioned before, we're going to have a heavier, slightly heavier concentration of marks on the left side of this particular post. But we'll make it feel a little bit more rounded when we start with the watercolor applications. And we're almost ready for that, but before we go to that, we'll go ahead and erase any remaining pencil lines. And now our pen and ink drawing is complete. Or is it? At this point in the drawing process, after I've actually videoed this part, I decided to go back and add a little bit more of a horizontal element. Initially, I wanted this drawing to have a very strong vertical feel about it, but uh, at this point, I felt like I needed to go ahead and add a horizontal element. So I did decide to include the wire that connects to the post underneath. And you can see I just defined the contour lines and then used a bit of vertical hatching to describe it. And now our pen and ink drawing is complete and we're ready for watercolor washes. For this particular painting, I used Cotman Watercolors by Windsor & Newton. And I used three different brushes. Each one of them are Grumbacher Golden Edge brushes and all three are round. I used a number 14, a double zero, and a number four. We're going to start with a mixture of cadmium yellow pale hue with just a touch of yellow ochre and start adding a bit of color to the body of the bird and also the fence post. So we're going to use a very watery application initially here. So we just want to get some light applications of color on the surface of the paper. So we're going to start in that transition area where we have that darker shadow and then we have that stronger highlight on the right side. We'll also pull up some of this color using the larger brush up to the top portion of the head as well. Again, very watery, very light application. 
As I mentioned before, we'll go ahead and pull some of this mixture down into the fence post as well. This will help to connect the fence post with the body of the bird, but of course we have a lot of yellows in the fence as anyway. So it's a good idea to go ahead and get a little bit of color down there as well. Now we're going to incorporate a little bit of uh, blue purple. So I'm going to use Purple Lake and I'm also mixing that with just a touch of Intense Blue, which is very similar to a phthalo blue. Then we're going to start right along that edge where we just painted our mixture of yellow ochre and cadmium yellow pale hue. And uh, since the surface is still wet, we're going to have some bleeding that happens here. And this will create a nice transition between the cooler shadows and the warmer highlights. We'll go ahead and pull this mixture over to the darker wings on the left side as well while we have this mixture on our brush. And you can see here I'm still using the larger number 14 brush. Even though these areas seem pretty small, you still have a lot of control with a larger brush. We'll go ahead and dry up these initial applications uh, with the hair dryer. And then it's back with another application. Sticking with our blue-purple mixture, we'll go ahead and add a little bit of color around the eye. And we'll bring this color down into the shadowed areas right underneath the head. And with a little bit of water on our brush, we can kind of pull the edges there and make them a little bit softer. We'll do the same thing right at the top of the head, pulling some of that blue-purple up to the top of the head. Now we'll grab a little bit more of our blue-purple, this time a little bit more concentrated with the intense blue. And we'll add a little bit more of a shadow underneath the head and around the eye as well. Just pulling in a little bit more of that blue. And of course we'll add this color to the darker feathers on the left side as well. Some of that blue-purple is going to show through these applications, which will build up a little bit more complexity in the color here. We'll also use this color down in the area of shadow that we have on the bottom side of the body. You'll notice that I've switched over to a slightly smaller brush and this is to help me create some of those textural marks, the very subtle textural marks. You can see them on the upper portion of the body here where we're getting a little bit of a difference in value. We'll continue making applications, uh, slowly making the colors a little bit more intense. In this case, I've added just a touch of Payne's Gray to the mixture just to make the value a little bit darker and to mute the color slightly. We'll take this darker version of the color up around the eye again as we progressively make the value slightly darker. We'll also pull out a few strokes to indicate some of the spots that happen up here as well. Now we'll use a bit of cadmium yellow and we're going to go ahead and dress the eye and the beak. Now the colors are a little bit more intense here so we're going to use a little bit less water and I've switched over to the double zero brush to address this small little detailed area. We'll go ahead and pull some of this color over to the beak after we've addressed the eye and uh, we'll while the surface is still wet, we'll grab a little bit of cadmium red deep and we'll also mix that with a little bit of cadmium red pale hue and apply that color directly to the end of the beak and allow those colors to blend together a little bit. That will help to just incorporate a little bit more of that color down towards the bottom part of the beak. It's going to be very subtle here. But after we've allowed it to dry just a little bit, just a couple of minutes, we'll go with a deeper application, a slightly more intense application here. Now at this point, I see that the colors on the breast need to have a little bit more depth, so it's another application here with the yellow ochre, a very light translucent application. Now as we continue to work our way down to the legs, we'll go ahead and mix up a color here. We'll use a bit of our uh, purple lake, and we'll also add just a bit of cadmium red pale hue. Then we'll start on the shadowed side of the leg and start making our applications. We're going to leave a couple of open areas for highlights here because of course we'll, we'll remember that our light source is originating from the right side and we need to have some highlights here. So we'll start with our darker applications or our more intense applications on the left side. Then with a more watery wash we can go back and fill in the areas that we've left open. So even though we have a highlighted area here, we're still going to have a touch of color. Now we'll go back to the beak and make that color a little bit more intense again with another application of our red mixture. 
with just a touch of Payne's Gray mixed in with our yellow ochre will make the shadows on the beak just a little bit stronger and then we're ready to start addressing the post itself. We're actually going to start here with a bit of sap green and I know that sounds completely crazy but there are some green undertones that happen down here so we'll start by just laying in a light wash of sap green here and there and again we're just looking at the photo reference just picking up clues on where these colors might exist. Now while the surface is still mostly damp, we'll add a bit of burnt sienna with a more deliberate application. You can see the color is a little bit more intense here and we'll allow this mixture to flow into the green applications that we just made. You'll notice that as these colors are added, I'm using brush strokes that mimic the same directional strokes that I made with the pen and ink. And it's important to think about this because even though we're applying a watery wash here, the direction of your brush stroke is also important as it can help to, to develop texture and of course the illusion of form. Now I'm adding a bit of yellow ochre here and there and allowing it to mix a bit with burnt sienna and that's going to result in a variety of different oranges. And you can still see some of those greens that are popping through here and, and there and as we continue to add slightly darker values and slightly more intense colors you'll still see hints of that green show through. So to make the values darker here I'm just adding a bit of burnt umber and also just a touch of Payne's gray which is a, a darker cooler gray to create some of these shadows. Now of course the shadow is going to be a little bit stronger up here right underneath the, the upper lip of the post for lack of a better descriptive word where we have a little bit of a shadowed area. You can see uh, there's just a touch of blue in here too and that's just the same intense blue that we used before with a bit of Payne's Gray. So now we're getting to the point where we have a nice colorful post down here. It's not exactly the same colors that you might see in a piece of wood but uh, it's still translating as a wooden post. Now we need to develop a little bit of contrast on the highlighted side of the bird. So we're going to incorporate a little bit of a design element here. So I'm going to use a mixture of Payne's Gray with just a touch of intense blue mixed in just to give it a little bit of a cooler feel. But for the most part, it's mostly made up of Payne's Gray. We're going to use the larger number 14 size brush and try to cover this area as quickly and deliberately as possible so that we have more of an even wash. We'll also go ahead and bring this wash over to the left side of the head as well and down to the upper portion of the body. Again, just creating additional contrast here so the bird pops out against the background a little bit more. Now you can see I'm being very careful here with a large brush trying to make sure that I don't pull these washes into the body itself. Now if you don't feel comfortable doing this you can always use a material like masking fluid and cover up these areas and that will give you a little bit more freedom with your brush when you're creating these washes. After I added this blue-gray wash to the top, I was pleased with the contrast it created, but I felt like it made the composition a little too heavy at the top. So I took a little bit of an artistic risk and brought down some of the red from the beak and put a wash around the wooden post just to make the image pop a little bit more. And here's a look at our completed image. Well, thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you were able to pick up a couple of things here and there. Remember, subscribe to the channel if you want to stay caught up on the free videos that I post here on YouTube. You can also check out three free course videos and eBooks by clicking on the link that you see on your screen or in the description below. And you can always watch another video. As always, I wish you the very best in your artistic success.